So good afternoon, everyone, uh, and welcome to this conversation on a book uh, that has recently come out. Can you show them? Those of you who have not read them, read it, please do. Uh, this is, I think, um, one of the only books we have on the subject, especially uh, traversing the contemporary uh, and and the historical on the subject. So it's uh, it's an important book on on a subject that I think was. Uh, it, we were waiting for a book of this kind. Uh, and it is also, it bridges the generational gap between Professor Muni and Rahul. Uh, we have covered an entire generation uh, of scholars on the subject. And I think uh, on, the, on the panel here, we have, uh, if I may say so, three of the most uh, prominent Southeast Asia scholars uh, that we have at the moment. Because uh, uh, if you see the writings, if you see the, uh, the kind of conversations and the debates on Southeast Asia and India. Uh, there is a younger generation that has taken up uh, that conversation. And I think uh, these three here are uh, going to be very significant if, if they are not already voices uh, in the field. Uh, so with that, I welcome you all. Uh, I welcome Professor Muni and Rahul, who, uh, uh, who of course, are the authors of the, of the volume. And uh, I think Rahul will be speaking today yeah. uh, on the book. Uh, we have two discussions, and then we will open this up for a broader conversation on India, Southeast Asia, India, and Southeast Asia, and hopefully um, the broader shifts in the region and in the consequences for Indian foreign policy. Um, but thank you all for coming. And um, without much ado, Rahul, why don't you tell us about the book? Thank you, Professor Pant, uh, for that kind introduction, and also hosting us uh, for this book launch and book discussion. Uh, it's indeed an honor uh, and a privilege. Uh, well, about the book, I think uh, you've read about the book. Uh, there's something not here, but on, as you have seen the flyers, I'll just focus on very briefly on three main uh, issues that this book tries to address. The three cardinal debates on India's eastward engagement, India's engagement with South and East Asia. Uh, the first is. What is the nature of transition from look east to act east? So nomenclature apart, the semantics apart, how substantial has this change been from look to act east? That is number one. Second, a lot of like majority of scholars say that India's eastward engagement started in 1992. Is that really the case? Did India actually start, start its engagement with Southeast Asia in 1992? And there was nothing substantial before that? We try to address uh, that issue as well and have come up with our own understanding on the issue backed by facts and government data, archival material, and whatever was available. To, and we use that to the best of our abilities. Going before Luki's policy, how much was how substantive was the interaction, how substantive was the engagement with Southeast Asia, who were the drivers, what were the major actors uh, who played a role in first in, in promoting that kind of engagement and also factors that hindered uh, such kind of engagement. Uh, Lukey's policy in 1992, I would say 99% of the literature that is available would say even the government documents say that in 1992, when we launched our Lukey's policy, our focus was on economic engagement. So the flying geese model, looking at the Asian tigers, India's own uh, economic reforms and structural, uh, uh, structural economic reforms and all that. And it was only in the phase two of Lukey's policy, and more prominently, Acti's policy, that India started giving attention to the strategic component. Uh, our understanding is different. We've argued in this book that India's engagement uh, through Lukey's policy with the Southeast and East Asian countries, strategic component was right there in the beginning, and it was one of the most important components. Uh, if you look at Myanmar, if you look at the Malabar, Milan exercises, uh, engagements with Singapore, all of, uh, all of that uh, proves it. Uh, so these are three uh, cardinal debates that we have tried to uh, make sense of and contribute uh, in our own ways. Uh, and also, if you look at the structure of this book, we have divided India's eastward engagement into seven phases, uh, starting from antiquity to the activist policy. If you uh, get a chance to have a look at the book, you'd 
find those details. Uh, we've also sort of tried to define what India's, what does East mean for India? And our understanding is that ge even geographic concepts are dynamic in nature. It depends on how you look at uh, the international system, where you are positioned in terms of your military economic capabilities, and how you want to shape your foreign policy. And that has shaped India's uh, uh, definition of East. And that's why the changes. And that, that is the reason why today Indo-Pacific has become a part of India's eastward engagement. Uh, all in all, this book is written for scholars and strategic community. I think ORF is uh, being one of the premier institutes of India and one of the fastest growing in the world. I think this is the right kind of audience that we were looking at. So uh, thank you, Professor Pan, for that. And uh, we'd welcome questions and comments if you have any queries about our book. We'd welcome that, and uh, I guess we open the floor. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Uh, so let me start by uh, Yume. Uh, do you want to go first? Yeah. Um, let me uh, first congratulate the authors for the book. Uh, I think, uh, to me, there are two interesting aspects of the book. Uh, the first is, you know, in a sense, uh, you know, the authors, the book, uh, kind of bring India's foreign policy. You know, the India's foreign policy kind of uh, has come around and uh, come full circle, in the sense that, uh, you know, it started off with cultural exchanges in the ancient period. Uh, then today we see under the uh, activist policy, we see the emphasis on. Uh, cultural and, and civilizational linkages. So I think it has come a full circle in that sense. Uh, the other aspect uh, that uh, I find it interesting is that each aspect, um, uh, uh, waves and uh, um, phases that we have seen, uh, the, each phase that we have seen uh, has a very unique or uh, specific dimension that it has emphasized. Let's say, uh, if the ancient period has emphasized the cultural exchanges, we have seen during the Nehru's period, or during the British time, we have seen the strategic element being introduced into the engagement. Then we have also seen the diaspora engagement, the diaspora dimension being uh, introduced. Then we have again seen during the Nehru's period, uh, the political and ideological dimension introduced into the engagement. Uh, then I think uh, in the Lucas policy we saw the introduction of the the economic component. Yes, in the in, as uh, Rahul has mentioned, these elements were always there in the past. But I think it, each state has emphasized a certain dimension, a certain element of uh, that engagement. I think in the Lucas policy again emphasized, uh, you know, in the beginning it emphasized the economic uh, dimension. Then gradually it uh, moved to in, inter, uh, institution. In, um, integration with ASEAN, uh, with the ASEAN, and then of course we also see the strategic element uh, being introduced. Uh, then I think in the ACTIS policy we again see the reemergence or the comeback of the cultural and diasporic uh, or diaspora dimensions in the in the engagement. Um, now I think what this book does is that it takes you uh, a reader through all these different phases. And in a sense, uh, to me, it gives, uh, you know, today, if you look at the India's engagements with the East under the ACTIS policy, I think it kind of encompasses all these elements that uh, has been introduced in the past. Uh, now, as far as uh, the, uh, or uh, another point that I want to mention about the, the book is, uh, I think it would be fair to say that this uh, book uh, is a, is a balanced assessment of India's engagement with the East. Um, I say this because, um, as Rahul has also mentioned, um, I think uh, we have seen one element of uh, criticism about India's uh, engagement with the East, uh, which is that India has not done enough in engaging with the East. And I think uh, what this book has done is, perhaps this is the most uh, forceful counter-narrative to that, uh, to that uh, criticism. Uh, then uh, it's also a very objective uh, assessment of the of India's uh, engagement with the East, uh, because uh, while it highlights you know the external constraints of India's engagement with the East, it also it also brings out you know the internal limitations that India has uh, in engaging uh, the East. Um, 
to me, there are four uh, contributions that this book uh, makes uh, to existing literature. Uh, one to me is that, uh, uh, as I said, uh, it put to rest the assumption that uh, India's engagement with the East is of recent origin. So by recent origin. Um, so by enlarging or by looking at the long, longer time frame, it has been able to, uh, it, it avoids the tendency of, you know, looking at uh, India's engagement uh, that, uh, you know, it, it started only in the, in, in the 90s when the Lucas uh, policy was launched. Uh, then it also makes the argument that um, the, uh, the uh, India's engagement with the East is one of continuity rather than change. And uh, I think uh, this, this point also, um, one, you know, to me, uh, a, a key assumption that seems to guide India's uh, foreign policy towards the East is that uh, India is a stabilizing force in the East. I think that assumption seems to guide, seems to you know, uh, push India's uh, you know, uh, engagement with the East. If you look at, for instance, if you look at in the, 90, uh, in the, in the 50s, uh, during Nehru's uh, period, uh, the emphasis was on India's role in um, encouraging freedom, anti-colonialism, anti-imperialism, and also stability in the East. Now, in, under the Actis policy, we are again seeing such, you know, um, let's say, uh, principles uh, in the sense that uh, today we are talking about uh, how India can contribute to stability and uh, prosperity in the Indo-Pacific region. So I think there is an underlying assumption that seems to drive India's activist policy. Uh, then the third, I think, contribution is that, mm, as I said in the um, uh, earlier, you know, it's 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 a very um, a forceful counter narrative to the criticisms against uh, India, uh, India's uh, policy towards the East. Uh, then the fourth uh, contribution, perhaps, is that uh, the book has uh, documented a period which hasn't really. Uh, been highlighted, or which hasn't really got the focus of scholars uh, in India and abroad, which is the period between Nehru and Nar uh, Narasimha Rao. I think that again, uh, by devoting a chapter on that period, I think is again a, a major contribution to to understanding India's locus or India's eastward uh, engagement. Um, in fact, the book. Um, also um, uh, discusses this, uh, provides rich information on, you know, in, during this period, and also uh, makes the point that India was, in fact, uh, you know, seriously, uh, con India seriously con considered uh, joining the ASEAN when it, uh, when it formed in 1967. Uh, so again, I think that uh, contribution is also uh, very uh, important. Um, and lastly, I think, uh, one issue, perhaps, uh, I mean, um, if the, I would, uh, one would have wanted um, a little more uh, from the book is uh, on um, Andaman and Nicobar Islands. Uh, yes, the book has discussed uh, and talked about, you know, the, the significance, growing uh, significance of uh, Andaman and Nicobar Islands uh, in, in the larger India's uh, engagement with the East. Uh, and it also mentioned, of course, the setting up of the dry uh, services uh, command in, in, in Port Blair and the importance of the Andaman Nicobars in engaging with territorial countries, uh, including Indonesia, Malaysia, uh, Singapore. Uh, but I would say that uh, this kind of reminds us of the 90s about the Northeast. There used to be a lot of debate around the role of the Northeast in India's Lucas policy. Uh, now, the, uh, but nothing contrary as such on the ground. I mean, I think today we are seeing again, uh, one could see a parallel, you know, here with the, the Andaman Nicobar Islands. Uh, so I would even um, rather, um, in fact, ask a question to the authors about what role do they see about the um, in the, uh, Andaman Nicobar Islands in taking forward India's, you know, uh, interests in uh, towards the towards the east in in the current phase. Maybe I'll say. Um, yeah. Um, 
basically firstly given how act east has become a very important policy tool which is being used by the current government i think this is a very timely publication and for that i want to congratulate both the authors professor muni and dr rahul mishra um think the main thing which the book does is uncovers a lot of facts which they use to question a lot of things which has been taken for granted when a person researches on southeast asia for instance i will not go into the cultural aspect or uh, when we can trace our engagements the initiation of our engagements with southeast asia that has been already covered by rahul and yome i think um, i would probably look into the other uh, side where uh, it was initially after the bandung conference in 1955 the general perception which is uh, which people have is the relation with southeast asia mainly deteriorated because of the uh, personality differences between uh, president sukarno and uh, prime minister nehru this book goes on to show that even there is a perspective beyond that it is not just the personality differences between the two uh, leaders but there was a normal existing strategic scenario the geo strategic environment the existing geo strategic environment that time also dictated this policy difference between the two leaders and how the two countries even after being non aligned the basic policy structure was non alignment but still there were some different attitudes in the foreign policy calculus in both the countries that created this rift so i think that is one of the major research questions that this book answers which was of interest to me second is um, i think the book at the very initiation says that the engagements between india and southeast asia there has been a maritime element and uh, there has been a lot of exchanges in the maritime domain but uh, what i would like to mention is um, you uh, though you have laid this out but in the future in the preceding chapters what more could have been brought out is how this maritime element now can be used to cultivate the relations because that has been very initially in the chapters been laid out that india is not the maritime element in the relation between the two countries or even in the lucky sir acti's policy this element has not been used to its fullest so how uh, can this element be used this is a question i would like to ask the authors besides the indo pacific domain that we are seeing what other mechanisms do you think can the maritime element be used to nurture the india southeast asia or even the east asia relations uh, given the growing indo pacific uh, discussions um second is um, these are the two main elements and i think yome has covered most parts of it but uh, yeah um other things are also as rahul has very clearly mentioned when we think of lukis we think of it as a economic tool but uh, that is not uh, the picture you can see that from the very archival data that they have drawn out in the government statements or during those times which goes on to show that it was the cold war dynamics and other existing political uh, events that were happening which influenced or which encouraged india to move beyond its close economy and to move beyond, beyond its non aligned approach and to look at the other uh, countries as well another thing is when we were talking about act east it's usually tagged with the present government this book goes on to tell you that the uh, the phrase acties goes much uh, previous um, much before prime minister modi brought it out in the uh, east asia summit in 2014 actually it was the us even i researching on this uh, topic i was not so much aware that the us uh, president and even the sec former secretary of state hillary clinton had come out with this statement that india should be acting east and not just looking east and that is where the entire phrase of and even if that was actually influenced by one of the uh, discussions between sushma swaraj and hillary clinton so even before this government came to power this concept of acties was there in their minds yes the book also goes on to show that it is more of a continuity than a change but i think uh, a major change has been the increase in focus i mean when i talk about increase uh, increase in focus i mean the geographical expanse of lukis the entire lukis policy has changed this it, it was initially asean is still asean centrality and asean still forms a predominant element Not, nobody can take that away but the fact that it now stretches to east asia it covers australia the pacific island countries even the eastern coast of uh, africa if we take the entire indo pacific domain in uh, in mind that is one of the major contributions of acties and that is also what the book goes on to uh, show so in those contexts and uh, in the last chapter when uh, 
the discussion is a lot on uh, how the uh, look east or act east policy and what are the challenges we are facing. There is a huge element in the book on how the northeast can be used for boosting connectivity. Again, uh, you've, uh, they have mentioned about the Kaladan multimodal project, the India Myanmar Thailand bilateral highway. But we also know that the Kaladan multimodal project has been, it is not progressing at a very good pace. Again, this is a question I would like to pose. Why do you think that is? What are the challenges that are being faced? Because you've mentioned a lot on infrastructure, mentioned a lot on connectivity. So why do you think this uh, element, uh, we have not been able to tap in these existing uh, infrastructure projects in, to their fullest? Third element, which uh, I think was uh, brought out, is how uh, India is negotiating in RCEP and how uh, our, still our membership in APEC has not been. But again, there was just one statement which mentioned that India's membership in APEC has not been entertained. Again, can you elaborate as to why do you think that is? So these are some basic questions more, which I think the book uh, needs to answer, uh, and I think which we can get an answer to in the uh, Q&A. So these are the few things I had in my mind which uh, needed to be answered by the book. But in all, I think the, fa the main question which comes to a reader's mind or to researchers' mind when we think about Lukis and Actis is what is the change? And is there any change at all? I think the book actually gives a very good de description as to what has been the change and how things have continued. I think for that, the last two chapters of the book are very significant because this is a main question which is being asked. So in those regards, it goes on to even discuss about the quadrilateral, how what kind of a role India is playing, and how ASEAN centrality is playing a role in the quadrilateral and uh, the recent uh, developments which you see in the Indo-Pacific. Yeah, I agree that more details could have been looked into that. But at the same time, it, it covers a huge time frame. And for that alone, there needs a lot of appreciation. So I think that is my comments. Thank you so much. Thank you, Pramesh. And, and uh, I think um, there were some questions that they've raised, which uh, perhaps it would be useful to have um, uh, your views, uh, Professor Muniz uh, and yours, Rahul. Uh, I would, uh, you know, I would also sort of uh, try to uh, make it somehow more policy relevant in the sense that the kind of audience we have in sitting in a think tank. Uh, because you do talk of uh, you know the challenges, and I think Pramesha brought it out in terms of uh, so what is it that why is it, there's this perception that you always hear from the Southeast Asians uh, that India is not doing enough, and you have tackled this in some ways, uh, but I think uh, the perception is very real, you know, you, you, that uh, India is still struggling. Uh, to come to terms with its growing weight in, 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 the, in the wider region, and in particular when you engage with Southeast Asia, for example. So the issue of whether we are delivering on infrastructure, uh, whether we are delivering, for example, there's a big discussion on Indian corporate sector. Why is it that it's so lackadaisical in Southeast Asia? Uh, where some, you know, in, in some ways you would expect Indian corporate sector to be very vibrant. Uh, in South, in a natural territory for Indian corporate sector. It's not, it, it has not panned out that way. And in fact, I was in, in one of the earlier discussions uh, on this topic where uh, one of our um, you know, uh, members of the um, yeah. Foreign um, Ministry of Foreign Affairs, Ministry of External Affairs, mentioned this point that, look, uh, Indian corporate sector need to up its game. So there is clearly um, the, uh, the, the, the synergy between state and the capital if you will, state and the markets, state and the corporate sector is not in sync. So in terms of challenges, when you, when you look at uh, how India and what perhaps India's role can be in going forward in a part of the world which is increasingly central to India's imagination, uh, you know, what's, what are sort of the practical policy challenges that India faces in the short to medium term? Uh, and in terms, of, uh, you know, in terms of conceptualization, in terms of... Uh, how do we think of, of, of this geography? Uh, does uh, thinking of this vast expanse of territory in Indo-Pacific terms give India advantages, or does it make India uh, does it make India starts more difficult? I think uh, I would pose those questions before uh, you know, before I open this up for uh, for wider sort of Sorry, questions. Please, please, yes, sir. Can I add a supplement? Sure. Your, your brief? You know, when you're touching upon the challenges, if you could also
feeling that we are not doing much. But keeping in view our financial constraints, because we cannot get into a bidding match with China. So realistically, keeping in view our constraints, what can we do? Yes. Sorry, sorry for this intrusion, but uh, Rahul, before you answer, um, you've mentioned a lot that the major powers like US uh, is expecting India to play a greater role in the region. Can you also elaborate as to what kind of a role you see the Southeast Asian countries in themselves uh, wanting India to play? What greater role can we play in that region in the view of the Southeast Asian countries besides infrastructure and other uh, domain as well? Thank you. many important and challenging questions. Uh, I'll start with the role of Andamans in furthering India's interest in the region. Well, we did not focus, like, exclusively focus on Andaman Nicobar Islands and their role in India's, in furthering India's maritime and strategic interest. What we tried to do is at least bring the role of Andamans in perspective. For example, uh, at one place in our book, we've said that not just Kolkata or Andamans or the Eastern Belt uh, uh, played a role in British maritime thinking, British India's maritime thinking, uh, when they looked at Southeast Asia, but also during the Chola period, where they used, first they established a command, as it were, uh, in Andamans, and from there they, they uh, had these repeated uh, military expeditions in Southeast Asia. And that is why, uh, if you go to Malaysia and see the archival material there, it talks a lot about the Chola and Pallava kings, uh, the kingdom playing a role in setting up the, uh, a new kind of system, political system in the country, and uh, also the influence, Indian influence in, uh, in Southeast Asia, Malaya, if you want to call it, or Malaysia and Singapore particularly. Uh, the Asian Civilizations Museum, if you go there, you'd see there's so much of literature available telling you that Eastern uh, Seaboard of India actually played a, a huge role. We did not focus enough on Andamans, and perhaps that would demand another book, uh, looking just at, the, as, just at the maritime element of India's uh, at least engagement. Uh, what role? maritime elements could play in furthering India's Actis policy. I think uh, that is very uh, much linked with this. Uh, I think uh, to make that change happen, uh, you have to really look at regional and sub-regional arrangements, uh, sub-regional such as the BIMSTEC, uh, which could first bring the eastern side, bring the eastern uh, cities, major cities, to the level of, let's say, Mumbai or other ports, uh, ports that are on the western side, right? So Bay of Bengal sub-region itself is so underdeveloped that it cannot play a role, right? The eastern uh, side of India, uh, whether it is Kolkata or Chennai or, or you have the, uh, the Ugly port or uh, Paradip port, these ports do not, they don't even figure in the list of top 50 ports in Asia, forget the word. So first we have to build capacity. First we have to uh, reach that level. Our ports and our uh, uh, industry has to reach that level. And I think on that part, there have been uh, quantitative changes. Uh, the Sagar Mala project or uh, a number of other initiatives that the government has taken actually would, in five to 10 years time, would contribute to that capacity building. And once that is done, then only you can think and act of, you know, uh, on those ideas of reaching out to other countries and helping them and uh, being, uh, trying to be an equal partner with them. Uh, as of now, I don't see uh, there is any scope for India to, to even try and match with what Singapore does as a maritime uh, city. So there is a long way to go and there's, uh, there's so much to do uh, when you, you look at maritime component. Indian Navy has played a great role and that's not, that did not start in 2014. 
that did not start in 1992. It has always been a predominant maritime power. And that, if you uh, look at the literature available, even our book has mentioned that, uh, back in the 1980s, late 80s, uh, the Australian and Indonesian navies were apprehensive of India, the Indian Navy acquiring aircraft carrier and submarines. Right, so Indian, the power of Indian Navy was always there. It, it played a strong role in HADR operations, the humanitarian assistance and disaster relief operations. There's no doubt about that. But when you look at the maritime domain and the economic component of it, there's uh, certainly nothing that you can really uh, offer uh, to the Southeast Asian countries. They are, they are really much ahead of us. Well, Northeast, I think, uh, the role of Northeast in Actis policy, and why is that not happening? I had the privilege to visit Northeastern states, the four of them, uh, as part of one Manian project. Uh, and sitting in Delhi, we often blame the central government, Delhi, for being responsible for uh, the shortfalls in delivery, the delivery deficit that is there in linking Northeast with Actis. Uh, Northeast with Southeast Asian countries making at least policy or look East policy a reality. If you go there, the Constitution of India says that law and order, land, and uh, police come under the state government. You go to Mizoram, the land acquisition, how it has to happen, what is the roadmap, what is the timeline, is to be decided by the local and the state governments. Now, India is w willing to the central government and the donor. Ministry of External Affairs are willing to work on uh, implementing the Kaladan multimodal project. Who's going to provide this, the, uh, these agencies uh, uh, the required uh, amount of land? The state governments and the local governments. So in that case, back in 2014, 15, what had happened was the locals had actually asked for much more compensation than they actually had deserved. Right, so overlapping claims and, and when all of that went to the state and local authorities, they, they thought that this was uh, really like a scam. And this time from the people's side, if you, if you uh, get a chance to interview the, uh, the local authorities, they tell you all, all of that. In Northeast, just 20 years ago, the main discourse, even today, the predominant discourse back in 1990s was Separate, separatism, insurgency, and uh, insurgent movements. And within 20, 25 years time, the discourse has changed so much that we have suddenly started blaming the government for not doing anything. A, a, uh, seven provinces of India which were facing insurgency and law and order situation 25 years ago are suddenly, the uh, scholars are suddenly questioning that well, that is fine, but what about the development? There is a process to it, right? There has to be incremental change, isn't it? So because the security situation has improved only in the past five, 10 years, this possibility of looking at Northeast as a corridor, as a gateway to Southeast Asia has opened up. What is happening is that the discourse in Delhi and elsewhere is actually moving faster than the ground reality. You have to put a reality check to that. You have to look at what is happening in Northeast, how things are at the local and the state government uh, level, what are the challenges that they are dealing with in terms of law and order and, and uh, development projects, and then, then link that with what the government, what the central government is doing. So there is a mismatch. There is a sort of uh, gap that we are not able to fathom. And that's why this is happening. Uh, well, RCEP and uh, EPIC, uh, we had a fascinating uh, book discussion yesterday in JNU, and one of India's leading economists was there in the panel. And he said that, well, you, we've been saying that India's uh, look east to act east transition is quantitative. It is more quantitative than qualitative. And why we say that? One of the reasons is that there is a delivery deficit. If RCEP negotiations had ap happened let's say in five, 10 rounds, you would have called that change a qualitative change. That there is a delivery deficit, that there is a mismatch between what we promise, what we say, 
at international multilateral forums and what we actually deliver, there is a difference, there is a gap, and unless we bridge that gap, nothing's gonna happen. So in case of RCEP, everybody knows who's, who's done a bit of Southeast Asia, that India's iron and steel sector, the industry, cluster of industries, actually rule uh, our position on RCEP. And these are two industries which on the political parties. So I guess the answer is clear. Uh, the political leadership, the policy makers have to uh, see to it that the leading industry clusters of India, the industry captains, who are in a position to not only shape India's industrial environment, policy environment, but also India's position on economic affairs. Uh, so they have to see to it that these changes happen at the industry uh, level. We see, uh, we often say that uh, India's corporate sector is actually much more open than the government. Uh, PSUs are really uh, laid back and they don't do enough. But even India's corporate sectors are very protection, protectionist in nature. They don't want to open up to uh, international competition. And you go to Southeast Asia, they name not one, not a dozen, at least three, four dozen industries where they feel that the industry captains, the leading industrial, industrial uh, uh, houses actually work, work as uh, protectionists. So I see there is a, uh, there is a very strong connection uh, between the policymakers and the industry sectors when it comes to protecting India's existing economic, if I may call the equilibrium. The challenges in Southeast Asian perceptions, I think I've covered a bit of that. You go to Singapore, you'd see that nine out of 10 people who are in, in medium to high rank in, in the uh, MFA are scholars and intellectuals who look at India from uh, a more intellectual scholarly perspective would say that our delivery deficit is the biggest problem. The rest of things we are doing fine. And these are questions that they've not only raised from 14 onwards, that is the Act East policy, but also Look East policy. And go back to Luke One use time and Cold War, uh, there again he had said that India's not doing enough. So Singaporeans have been shouting out loud, saying that you're not doing enough, and that's, not hap that's, that's something that they have been saying for the past 60 years. Right, so delivery deficit and not meeting expectations is the first thing that we have to do not meeting the expectations, Southeast Asians, uh, their expectations. And it is not con just confined to the corporate sector, uh, to, uh, to connectivity, or to investments. It is uh, also about very small little things. I mean, we, if you want to go or fly to Singapore, the airline you would choose, if you are rich and in a good mood, you'd take Singapore Airlines. We don't even have a you know, one airline which is worth its, its name, which is Indian, which can fly you to Singapore and to Malaysia. And Malaysia, by the way, doesn't have any, like India's, uh, if you want to go to Kuala Lumpur, you have to take, and you want to take Singapore Airlines, so stop at Singapore and then take another flight. Direct flights are the budget airlines. So there you go in terms of connectivity. Uh, Policy challenges in short to medium term, I think uh, we've addressed some of that in our, in our book and Professor Muni has been saying that too long, uh, that when we have to be consistent, when we deal with Southeast Asia, we have to be uh, very consistent in what we say and what we do. And even on Indo-Pacific, like he said, uh, we were not, uh, he said earlier, I think, that in, even on Indo-Pacific, the ministry was not clear whether Indo-Pacific is good for us, whether we want to go with the Americans and the Japanese, or we want to have our own idea of Indo-Pacific. Uh, second, if we have made up our mind that yes, Indo-Pacific is the way out for us, it's the right platform, we, we never endorse Asia-Pacific, now Indo-Pacific is the way out, then what are the tools for that? What are our basic uh, drivers for that? What are the tools that we are going to use to make sure that India remains at the center of Indo-Pacific? Uh, 
that I think is missing, and that's something that India has to work on, uh, rather than just saying that India it, it is in India's interest. Um, Indo-Pacific is a natural uh, regional architecture for India, and India is centrally placed. You have to propose certain mechanisms to make sure that India is uh, India remains a key player in the uh, Indo-Pacific. Uh, region. Yeah, let me, uh, that, uh, Rahul has answered most of the questions, but uh, let me address uh, uh, Harsh's uh, first very very question as to uh, what why India is not uh, doing enough. Uh, this is the perception. You are right, absolutely in the region, and it continues to be there even after five years of uh, activist policy. And this is where I say that uh, if activist policy was crafted to uh, answer this question that uh, India is not doing enough according to expectations, uh, activist policy has not succeeded in, in removing that impression. Now, why is this there? It's a long history and we must uh, look at it. Uh, why there are expectations out of India? I think first is that the U.S. has uh, redefined its strategic calculation in the region and India's place there. Don't ever forget that U.S. dominated this scene for a very long time. And they, dis they called for the shots in terms of strategic parameters. And now after, uh, call it pivot or after call it uh, end of the Cold War, uh, they find India is so uh, magnificently located in the region. And 2004 tsunami where uh, they, they collaborated, uh, the four countries collaborated with each other, the first quad experience came, uh, they feel that uh, India can play a major role uh, in Indian Ocean, uh, which India has not been playing. That has started changing the strategic perspective of whole of the region because most of the countries were the U.S. allies and, and they thought that yes, India can do a lot and why India is not doing. And do a lot and why India is not doing primarily because why is India not collaborating with us and fitting into the kind of scheme uh, which we have for the region in terms of Chinese assertion. I come to this. So first uh, rise in expectations is largely because of the 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 uh, change in the perspective of the U.S. strategic calculus has changed. Uh, why I want to repeat it and 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 stress it again, because there was a time when India was thought to be useless in the region. It it was thought to be a headache in the region. It was it it had to be kept out of the region uh, on almost every issue which uh, which we, we took, us. and that was the contribution of the Cold War which was led by the U.S. So this change in the perception had suddenly uh, brought India into the center stage of the regional affairs, and therefore expectations have gone up. Secondly, India is a major market, and uh, it, it's, it's a market of almost 1.6 billion people, approximately going, growing at the average rate of 6 to 7 percent, if we take a very modest figure also. Which other country is doing that? And therefore, uh, why anybody can afford to neglect, neglect it? So all of them are looking towards India and its potential and want to uh, have a share in it. Uh, most of these issues, whether it is a question of uh, RCEP or it is a question of value chain, why India is not fitting into, all come from this perspective as to why India is not letting uh, itself open up. To, to us and to our market. And this is where the role of corporate sector, which has been discussed, is very critical. I think corporate sector has not been um, very open on this. They have had huge hesitations. There are a couple of houses which have now started collaborating with China and uh, feel somewhat comfortable that, OK, uh, we have to deal uh, or we can deal with. This. Most of it, uh, you recall the BCIM as a proposition, the Bangladesh, China, India, Myanmar, was opened way back in the late 1990s. 
and none of the corporate sectors were willing to open this region to the Chinese. As a result, the BCIM never uh, took off in, in one way or the other. And then, uh, the, even now, the corporate sector actually comes in the way, whether we can open up uh, uh, RCEP, for instance. The whole question of tariffs, the differential tar tariffs which is coming in, the, in, in this context, is largely been influenced by, by the corporate sector that the Chinese would swamp the whole markets and we would be pushed out. So there is a, uh, this market potential which has raised the expectations and uh, they feel that India is not doing enough. And this is what which activist policy has not been able to I mean, no, no matter what the government claims, the fact remains wherever. Third is uh, the expectations of the region vis-a-vis -vis India is directly proportionate to their sense of threat vis-a-vis -vis China. And the more the Chinese become assertive, and the more the Chinese become spreading into the region, the more they look towards India. Whether for market, whether for strategic reasons, whether for some sort of a cushion, because uh, we must understand, Southeast Asia has a curious uh, mindset that they don't want to confront anybody in a front way, never, no, no, nothing. Even on the code of conduct issue in South China Sea, the way they are going you know, uh, around the bush uh, as to this is what we should do, they don't want to confront and they know they cannot confront. They, they, both, both these facts are there. And therefore, uh, the more the Chinese pressure is perceived, right or wrong, the more they look towards other powers. And in other powers, Japan was already there, US was already there, Australia was already there, India was kept on the margin. So more and more towards that why India is not doing this, why India is not doing this. I think these are the three reasons, and I think on all the three counts, there has to be a very serious thinking, maybe uh, not papers have been written enough, and that's about maritime, when you take, take the strategic aspect. Uh, that uh, to what extent India can go to meet these expectations. The delivery deficit is a major problem. But even without delivery, delivery deficit, should we jump into the quad? Like say question, it's not a question of de delivery deficit there. Whether we should theoretically and politically decide that okay, we will be a part of the quad and see if we can confront China in one form or the other. Should we be doing it is a question. Look at. Uh, Prime Minister Modi's statement in Shangri-La dialogue, so cautious so far as China is concerned, so cautious so far as Quad is concerned. There has been no time in the history where India has taken a very precipitate position that we will confront China. I don't remember any, even after 1962, that we will defend ourselves, but that we will take the Chinese bull by horn has not been there. It was not there during the British, when they were fighting in the Himalayas, when they were trying to contain. So there is a long tradition of this competition and cooperation coexisting in, in, in India's approach towards China. Now, if you are jumping into the quad, the manner that the other three countries want you to be there, the question arises, should we give up this balance which was there between? And, and, and that is the main question, which nobody is uh, frontally uh, addressing and, and, and answering. And everybody's hedging it here. That no, no, we'll do this, we'll do it. We'll confront China when it needs to be, but we'll cooperate with China. The Wuhan came out of that because uh, uh, Prime Minister Modi's government had given in last three and a half years, and I'm talking before Wuhan, an impression that we were strategically shifting closer to the US. And the Chinese were creating problems for us, therefore. I mean, today we are celebrating Azhar. Uh, let us uh, look back into and, and see what, what, what it has happened. Therefore, the, uh, and, and, and Wuhan came. And after Wuhan, uh, the whole uh, uh, discourse and rhetoric of, of strategic engagement uh, in, the, in the region, particularly vis-a-vis -vis China, uh, changed. So it's a, we, we need to uh, now market if, if Look, I mean, this is a, there is a, uh, which again is theoretical aspects, I don't want to get into that, but since Harsh is there, uh, look at the Indian, Indian developmental pattern. From the colonial period, 
India is the only country which had had a nationalist bourgeoisie, which had Tatas and Birlas, who manufactured. India was the one who was the de deindustrialization earlier by the British. But later on, even <coughs> during the war period, these were the houses which flourished. And they have struck their roots into this country in terms of the <coughs> corporate progress. Now, you don't find in any other Asian country this kind of an experience, including China. And therefore, the question is that if you open up to the whole world, on the world's uh, terms and conditions, on these tariffs and all that, the question arises, these people say, where do we go? And they have so far, rightly or wrongly, they have so far flourished only on the protective market of India, which is too huge and too diverse, and they have not been able to fully exploit it. So this is how it, it happens, whether we should open our market or not. So shall we confront the Chinese? Shall we open up our market uh, or not? Shall we become a, 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 a very important, very critical tool, though nonetheless, into the US scheme of uh, managing this region in terms of, and I, I, am, I, am, I, I repeatedly saying it, that please look at uh, in the US policy in the region from a perspective of their classical balance of power, in which in Europe, they dominated, they continue to dominate, they put Europeans against Europeans. And now they are feeling threatened vis-a-vis -vis China, and they want Asians to confront China, Asians against the Asians. Whatever the game, I am not putting value, I am not saying it's a pejorative game, it's a realistic game. In, in, in maintaining their own hegemony. Now, should India become a cog in that plan? That's where the quad question comes up again and again. I'm putting it very bluntly, and, and probably uh, in as uh, less sophistication as, as, as one can be. But when these questions come, then the whole, uh, whole issue of um, uh, responding to the expectations uh, get mixed up, and we get mixed results, and nobody wants to bluntly say that, look, we will not follow you. The, the whole phrase of uh, <coughs> strategic autonomy. That's what it is. That whether you, you, you're going to follow, follow it on. So that is one, one aspect which I thought you had raised this. It's a big, uh, but I've tried to cover. I want to say something on the Northeast, which, uh, Rame, uh, which uh, Rahul said about it. Uh, this is true, Rahul, that uh, Northeast is responsible for Northeast. But don't ever uh, spare the central government. Why not spare the central government? Largely because, uh, firstly, Northeast in the Indian uh, democratic power structure counted for very little. And therefore, the, the central government hardly bothered about it. Secondly, from the <coughs> beginning, the insurgencies and the instabilities uh, which were there, that it was not a congenial uh, theater for development and for other activities uh, which were there. And uh, this was used as a, in the traditional concept, as a defense frontier, uh, which if we developed, the Chinese would walk in. After 62, this was, I, I remember, I have even talked to Pranab Mukherjee at one stage when he was defense minister. They were not very happy with opening up uh, this region because that would uh, bring, even now, there are a lot of problems of Arunachal, you know, the trilateral ro commissions and roads and, and the connectivity problem always come and hangs on, on Arunachal, uh, whether you can do it. This is where BCIM got stuck in, in various ways. So there is, there is a problem that as a defense matter, we have always uh, uh, kept it preserved. And for last 60, 70 years, army is playing a major role there. Army is central role. It's not uh, the, 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 the regional, and I, I visit the region and I see that uh, this is what uh, there are. So the defense position uh, is, uh, is uh, uh, and, and you know, the whole constraints of insurgencies, instabilities, political constraints, we had not developed. Uh, you re remember, uh, uh, poor uh, Mani Shankar Ayer made a proposal for energy connectivity through this region. And who turned it down? The MEA turned it down. Because he was then the Minister of the Northeast Development. As a Northeast Development, he, he made it. So there are, there are uh, problems even within 
uh, one last point and I, I am done. That when you look at this book, it, narr it narrates you not by saying it explicitly, but having written now, we know what was driving us, the unfolding of the Indian state and its foreign policy. The evolution of the Indian state from civilizational state of the Hinduism and Buddhism and Islam to some extent, to a trading state of uh, spice trade or uh, Bali Jatra or whatever you say, which was the golden period. You know, that was the period when India dominated the whole world economy, global economy as it were. From uh, that state then became a colonial state. Then it became an aspiring Asian state where, I mean, the, the phrase which we have been discussing that President Xi uh, claims Asia for Asians is the, uh, has become a Chinese phrase. Uh, my God, I mean, it was Nehru who used it again and again and again and could not deliver Asia for the Asians is a different matter for various reasons. But the fact that he was the one, so he saw what in, in India's uh, engagement is, is almost we have seen the disintegration of an Asian vision, which is now being recreated under almost uh, uh, Chinese hegemony, and we are talking about multipolar Asia, and and everybody is talking about multipolar Asia. Not, but there. Uh, I mean, yesterday there was a question on um, um, this uh, BRI being an instrument of creating an Asian uh, uh, consolidation uh, under the Chinese leadership. It is a from top below, not uh, now. Nehru had Asia for Asians where everything would be discussed on the table by all the Asian countries. And he did not realize the power of the Cold War, power of the great powers, how it could really be. And so it, in a way, this book projects to you the evolution of the state from civilizational, trading state, colonial state, aspiring state, and then you come as a developmental state, which is Narsimha Rao onwards. That suddenly you start opening and, and, and you make a difference. Uh, we have not explicitly written in, in this manner, we could have, but this was the driving force as to what happens, how the gradually, and any foreign policy uh, to my uh, dear students, uh, those who are is still studying, that you have to link it with the character of the country which, is, uh, which you are studying. And no foreign policy can be devoid of this, these characteristics in which uh, a state evolves and manifests itself on the external stage, largely for domestic requirements and domestic priorities. So let me open this up. For um, questions, comments, observations. Yes, sir. My question is, uh, like Kishore Mahbubani had mentioned uh, about the ASEAN miracle, and also he mentioned that this was one of the f most fragile structure and somehow still st remained. Uh, and thanks to that type of fragi fragility in the very design and the way things were in 1967, it somehow survived. Did that type of uh, ASEAN structure and the type of secretarial support that the ASEAN Secretariat provides to all the member states uh, across all the 10 countries, did th that also have some impact in terms of India's own engagement with the ASEAN at that level? Although, as uh, you mentioned, that India chose not to sort of join ASEAN at that, that point of time, historically, yeah. You have discounted it. Yeah. Yes, OK, this is, can you give me an answer? Yeah. I just wanted to ask you a question. Recently, I have a scholar from here who went to Vietnam to look at uh, uh, Indian investments in Vietnam. Indian investments in Vietnam. The point is that she discovered that uh, there was this project that the Tatas had invested in. I don't know if you're aware of it, a power project which was eventually, they lost it, largely because the Chinese Communist Party uh, basically bribed Vietnamese Communist Party officials. So the thing is that, is there a level playing field in countries like Vietnam, for instance, for Indian investment? I mean, we've spoken about, you know, Indian protectionism and stuff like that. But have the Southeast Asians actually created a level playing field for Indian corporates and in the Indian private sector to invest? particularly when they're up against this giant called power, China, which is trying to sort of muzzle India out and uh, deny it, uh, uh, you know, the investments that it is seeking. So, thank you. May I 
start with commenting on your uh, the northeast. <laughs> no, I just want to say that I started commenting on northeast with the assumption that we had already lynched the central government for all its faults and follies. So that's a taken, right? So central government has not delivered. But even the northeastern uh, states have not delivered. I'm not disputing that. I said in addition to that, you can't have drawn this. Yeah, happens. yeah, that's absolutely. absolutely. To, to my mind, your uh, uh, comments came as a defense of the central government. Absolutely not. <laughs> I am nobody to defend the central well, government. <laughs> but may I now respond to these two questions? One is on ASEAN. We wanted to get into ASEAN. What was the ASEAN first? ASEAN first was a truncated ASEAN. Please don't forget. I mean, the, uh, they in the very first uh, manif <coughs> manifesto or agreement, whatever they had, they said it is a ten-country organization. But we are starting with five or six-country organization. And who these five or six countries? Anti-communist, anti-Vietnamese, pro-US. Strategically, it was the U.S. which led to this. Now, this ASEAN is formed in 1967. The first summit of ASEAN, because may, many of us are enamored of ASEAN. Oh, it's a great organization. That's why I want to remind. The first summit of ASEAN takes place in 1976. Nine years, there was no ASEAN activity as it is. Now, we wanted to join ASEAN even in 1966. Mrs. Gandhi, which is a less known fact, it is there in South, and we have put it in the book. Mrs. Gandhi sends her Minister of State to plead with most of the ASEAN uh, active players that we want to get in provided you don't tie yourself up in ideological and strategic parameters. That we want a regional cooperation to take place but not as defined by the US, <laughs> simply to fight as a cushion. You know the, the domino theory, that if Vietnam wins, everybody else will be lost. There were already communist insurgencies in Malaysia and various other countries. And I think that was invoked largely to bring them together as, 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 as it were. So we were not, not interested in ASEAN. We were very much interested in ASEAN. But what kind of an ASEAN? <laughs> that is one thing. Secondly, again, I mean, look at, and I have told this to many of my ASEAN friends and very upset with me whenever I say, and I've stayed there for six, eight years. So I've been interacting both in diplomatic and uh, academic uh, fields. Uh, that, uh, look, take the Cambodian question. In 1980, they decided, because they decided to take India on. In 1980, India was invited to be uh, a mem a, in a, a, what you call a full dialogue partner of ASEAN, not sectoral, which we were made later on. In May 1980, Eric Gonzalez again uh, went there and, and mobilized it. And we were invited. And this, uh, this was in May. I think the, the meeting was to take place somewhere in Kuala Lumpur or somewhere else. And in July, we recognized the Hang Samarin regime. Hang Samarin regime was backed by the Vietnamese in Cambodia against the Khmer Rouge. And they become so upset that Narsimara also turned his cold feet that if we go, we will only be criticized there. And they also have, were not interested in India at all, which is largely a Cold War decision. It was, and uh, again, don't forget, 79. Uh, Atal Bihari Vajpayee breaks his China visit because the Chinese had attacked the Vietnamese on the Cambodian issue. So we had very close links with the ASEAN which was left out, which became a new ASEAN later on. But we have continuously been in, in, in interaction with the ASEAN, not as an organization because they did not want us there, but as members of the ASEAN, we have always been interacted uh, interacted uh, with, with, with them. And uh, that is what our history, and now we are, we are there. Uh, I think we are doing as much, uh, in fact, most of the ASEAN programs today, I say, you know, they say India is not doing enough. No, it's not doing enough. Uh, I had written a couple of papers for the eminent persons group, which on the, what is it, 20th anniversary or something of the relations, they wanted to change. Shamsaran and others were there in, 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 in that, that group. 
we wrote papers and we said that uh, uh, India is uh, uh, not not coming uh, forward. None of the programs like ASEAN lecture we have are funded by any of the ASEAN countries. There is only one country which is called Singapore. And I think uh, we have said Singapore has been very helpful for India to integrate with uh, ASEAN. No other country has been coming so much of the forward about it. But anyway, on, on uh, in the, uh, Singapore, uh, uh, you know, the, the uh, 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 India becoming very close, uh, close to ASEAN, uh, is, uh, Singapore is the only country which has a center for India or ASEAN and South Asian studies. Nobody. We are now, now uh, having India chairs. We are sending people here, there, everywhere. No other uh, ASEAN country today has any effort to study it. But sir, Vietnam is doing and they complain to us. We have just there. now, I know. No, no, this, no, is, no. this is an year. This is, this is last year and a half or two years that we have set up a center in Vietnam. We have set up a center and they have set up a center in India. They are, they are still complaining that we don't get chairs, for example, when ICS is No, no, that's a different story, uh, Harsh. We, we have made mess of the India chairs. I mean, we, we, we will get into other... We have made uh, India chairs not only for the past two years, for past almost ten years. What kind of people we send for the India chairs? You will pick up a Bangladesh expert and send him to Tanzania. You want examples? I have the names. You will pick up a Southeast Asia expert and send him to um, uh, Russia. Now, what are we doing this? So, yes, I mean, that's why they have right. This is where delivery deficit is important. Because it is not only, I mean, we have taken up these projects and are not delivering it or are not delivering it to the satisfaction of the targeted country. This is where the problem is. So, not that intentions are bad. But the way we manage and, and delivery deficit is a serious, serious problem of internal coordination, which I'm sorry, despite Mr. Modi's, Prime Minister Modi's very well-intentioned efforts, he has not been able to succeed, despite all the, all the control which is there. So this is what, uh, what, what it happens. So even Southeast Asia, as I said, they want India as a cushion because of a certain pressure. And they want India as an uh, as a uh, as, uh, as a uh, you know uh, a market where they can enter easily. Uh, beyond that, they haven't done much for India. Uh, he's he's uh, he will tell us maybe some story how much <coughs> India is loved there. India is complained there. Tumne ye nahi kiya, tumne ye nahi kiya, tumne ye nahi kiya. And all these complaints may be correct because yes, we won't deliver. It. We don't deliver it. But the, the, the whole thrust of our, our book is ki, um, uh, it, needs, it needs two to tango. That you, uh, you know, the, as you will see the preface, in preface we said, when I was, I spent about eight years in Southeast Asia, and everybody would say, you are not doing this, you are not doing this, you are not doing this. And even Indian diplomats, the very senior MEA officials would say, yes, yes, we neglected them, we neglected them. So this, this is a book to tell them, no, we never neglected them unilaterally. That's what the whole effort is. And, and therefore, uh, you cannot build any relationship. And I can have the same story about the US. I had a long discussion with, uh, what is his, his name? Uh, uh, Rajamon's friend, uh, Ashley Tallis. Uh, you, we have not done this. You went to Soviet Union. I said, we went to Soviet Union in 54, 55. We were independent in 1947. From 1947 to 54 is seven long years. What did we do during those seven long years? And I said, look, I'll tell you what we did. Nehru took his first state visit to the US, 1949. And while going to the US, he writes a letter to Krishna Menon, consulting with him what we should be doing. And I read out two lines of that letter, Krishna, quote, why not we align ourselves somewhat with the US to build our scientific, technological, and military capabilities, unquote. So Nehru goes with that intention. Nehru in 1939, many people do not know because Nehru bashing is in fashion. And, and whatever he did uh, was wrong today. 
1939, Nehru's visit to China was funded by the Institute of Pacific Relations based in the US. The US wanted India to assert itself against the British colonialism. It is after 45 that the two unite and the whole Cold War was uh, drafted by a committee of the US and the British. The US did not know much about Asia. The British knew a lot about Asia. So they were almost leading them to uh, them to this one. So there are several asked similarly about this is about the US and uh, that's not the subject. But uh, in, in ASEAN also, uh, it's not that we have been erring all, all the time. Yes, we might have not carried out few things very, but the fact remains that they were equally responsible. They were not interested in India at all during the Cold War period. Have no mistake about it. Before, yes, I mean, Singapore came to make us build uh, their army and uh, Nehru did not want to do it largely because that would have annoyed the Malaysians. And he was much closer, friendly, uh, much friendly with the Malaysians. And he did not want to, and that, there are various other aspects of it. Anyway, one last, one, one last, Pakistan factor comes up much later. The, uh, one last about the uh, level playing field. Look, in, in corporate world, everybody greases. So don't say that if the Vietnamese are being greased by the Chinese, or not only Vietnamese, everybody else is being greased by the Chinese, uh, there is no level playing field for Indians. The Indian corporate sector knows very well how to grease the other side and get many of the contracts out of this. So that's not if that's a part of the British, uh, sorry, the, the, that's a part of the uh, what I say, corporate dynamics, let us put it this way. So that's not a factor. There may be other, there is, the Chinese simply have deep pockets and they deliver fast and they deliver on time and, 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 the, and the result is, look, in Sri Lanka, uh, if you go on the, on the golf face, there were two hotel sites side by side. One was given to ITDC, much bigger land given to ID, ITDC. The other one given to the Chinese for Shangri-La Hotel. They built up Shangri-La Hotel, which was now blasted off. We have still not completed ITDs. What do you do with that? You ask the PWD, which really gets into it, and I have talked to some of them, PWD people says, sir, we have to build the project which we get, 40% is not in our control. Now you're talking about greasy. Where does it go? Therefore, they use inferior uh, uh, fittings, substandard uh, construction, it goes slow, uh, labor becomes a problem, what, whatever else. So, yaar, ghar ka system sudha rengye na, nahi to kaise kaam chahe? Sorry, sorry. Uh, just about the India, and, uh, India Studies Centers in Southeast Asia. Uh, just to add to Prof. Muni's point, we had India Studies Center in Jakarta and a smaller one in Bali. If we have, in Thailand, we have one in Chula Longkorn, one with Thamasat, one with Chiang Mai. In Myanmar, we used to have in, one in Mandalay. Now, just Google for half an hour and see what kind of people were sent, as Prof. Munir said. But also look at the facilities that are available there. In Thailand, for example, or even in, in Indonesia, you're given a space which is like, what, a kitchen size? You don't have a website, you don't have the secretary of staff. So there is virtually nothing. And the person who is sent there has to just survive on whatever money he gets for the government. And then he doesn't have the expertise. So it's a very sad story, appalling story on both sides. Uh, with the Vietnam, the Tata project in Vietnam, before the Chinese chipped in, the Tata project was in shambles actually. There were problems between the, between the Tata and the Vietnamese uh, local and central authorities. And the project was, I think, if I'm correct, it was shut down for uh, three, four months. Like there was uh, literally nothing happening there. And that is when the Chinese, you know, uh, of course, grazing, et cetera, was there. But that's where they put up a proposal of sorts, saying that 
look, we have to do something about it. And Vietnamese were convinced. So the problem was also on the on the Indian side, that is Tata's side. There are details available, I think, on the net. You see. Them. So I think I think one conclusion uh, perhaps is that we need to send these three very interesting <laughs> youngsters as our representatives. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> In South East, so you take over the India centers there and go. <laughs> Done on uh, what kind of people are appointed on India. It, it would be worth it. Just, just, uh, not at I, all. ICCR, ICCR would, uh, should have data on that. And I tell you these days, earlier it was different expertise which was good. These days, people who are not even masters having degree, having master's degree, are being appointed as India chair from the professor's. Uh, you know, it's, it's I a, can say for sure, but three of us don't qualify. But perhaps you now qualify for India chair. No, no, no. I'm almost uh, tasking uh, your, your uh, students here to study science in ORS. Get a paper and find out more details. <laughs> 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 we can name names now. <laughs> no, you don't have to name. You just name what qualifications, where are you sending, what expertise. How the selection takes place? Yes, I think uh, you know, in terms of just in terms of uh, energizing the people. For example, scholarship has been a big problem. How many scholars are we producing who are actually who know the language? For example, who can do uh, uh, you know basic fundamental research in these areas? I mean that that is a that is a problem across the system. So it's not simply confined to Southeast Asian scholars. But I think. Um, uh, you know, g given the focus on, on Southeast Asia over the last few years, you would have expected uh, a, you know, a lot more scholars coming out uh, and doing uh, work on the, on, the, on the country. That is not simply not happening. Uh, and I think that shows you some problem in terms of our priorities and how they are being uh, aligned. Um, but again, uh, are there any other questions, comments, observations on, on Southeast Asia, East Asia authors here before we conclude today's discussion. OK, so with that, I think uh, let me thank Rahul and uh, Professor Muni for taking time off. And let me once again apologize for starting late. Uh, but uh, that's my fault. Uh, again, uh, I think this is a conversation that should continue. So many more books to you, Rahul, and to others here as well. We look forward to uh, <coughs> more books and per perhaps more professorial chairs with, with Professor Muni's blessings. <laughs> thank you. Thank you very much.